Oh hi, welcome to another one of these videos where I spend some time giving my thoughts on a FF14 character. In today's video, we'll be taking a look at a rather evil character, someone absolutely ruthless. That is if your name happens to be Alfino. To the rest of us, she's just a little sassy at times, but not too dangerous. Ryle is one of the supporting characters in FF14 and I would say she's a bit underrated often overshadowed by the other big players in the FF14 story, but perhaps it's good at times to look at characters that maybe got a little less screen time. I was kinda surprised how many people really enjoy Kryon as a character. One day I was just looking through the FF14 reddit and saw a post of fan art on Kryon and it was pretty much full of comments of people showing appreciation for the character and being disappointed that she did not make an appearance in the Endwalker trailer nor in any official artwork. So it kinda made me want to talk about it cause looking back, yeah she is a pretty awesome character. The point of this video is to have a look back at Kryo's story in F14 and delve deeper into some of the aspects of this particular character so that if she does end up getting a fair bit of screen time in Endwalker, you can hopefully appreciate it a little more. Or if not, then you let Yoshida know how much you hate his guts. Then let us begin. Kryle is a reference to an FF5 character of the same name, even donning the same robe she would wear when equipped with the white mage job. Uh, I don't blame the devs, I mean she be looking hella cute in it. The biggest benefit of her addition to F14 was that I was able to finally figure out the way her name is pronounced as I always wondered between Kryo and Krille, though I myself would always like to call her Kara, as that was her name in the RPG translation of FF5, uh, a game I've replayed a dozen of times. Coming back to FF14, Kryo of course isn't a Dune folk name, and as such it conveniently is not her real name, but an adopted name. Well, her name is kind of a flasterka. In Japanese, her name Kururu does fit a Lalafell name, which is her original FF5 name as well as the one she was called in some of the fan translations of said game, but in the English script they had changed her name to be Cryo to go along with the modern renaming of her, so they had to make up this idea that she got an adopted name for that version specifically and to make it even more confusing. It's possible that her real name in the English script is Kururu. Anyway, Kryo has quite the memorable character introduction, arguably one of the strongest in the entire game. One contributing factor is the slow build up from when she's mentioned until when she's introduced. She gets properly introduced in 3.1, but the organization she's in gets brought up already in 2.0 and she gets mentioned by name 2.3 when Minfilia is informed that she had survived. This is of course something Final Fantasy XIV likes to do a lot. Allude to things much earlier, make the world seem much larger by having us interact with only small parts of the world uh, as a whole and opening it up little by little with each expansion. But another thing that gives Kryon a strong first impression besides the lead up is that she fills quite a nice role in the story. On paper, it seems like she's just another Archon from Charlian to bloat the cast, but there's three significant things in play here. The fact that her order was secluded from the motherland, her being the sole survivor of the tragedy that happened to the Isle of Val, and the fact that she has the Echo. It gives us a fresh perspective since all the other Scions have already been to Eorzea for a good while whereas Cryo is really fresh into living her life here. She even says as much in one of her first lines, saying that a trip to Eorzea was long overdue for her. But to go back on the point of her having the Echo, that too on surface seems like it isn't adding much. Minfilia had the Echo, Ironbolt had it, Uzail had it. The key difference with Cryo is her background. The students of Baldesion was extensively researching the nature of the Echo, and though at first she was the person being researched, Ryle herself eventually joined the group as a student, so it makes sense she knows a lot on the subject. 
Indeed, we gain much better insight into what the Echo is thanks to her explanations, and it's really the first time we start to really gain a better understanding as to what the Echo really is, instead of it being this vague magic power. Indeed, her character plays perfectly into this theme. Every time up to this point, whenever a character with the Echo is brought up, it's either to send people to fight a primal without getting tempered, or used on the playable character to trigger a flashback cutscene for us, the audience. With Cryo, they really wanted to break this mold. Not only does she come in and give you crucial knowledge of the Echo, but she herself has a unique power that she uses to achieve something completely different, and the writers use her to explore different ideas, such as what if a character was to artificially transfer over the Echo, which is what they did in 4.0 by the Garlins experimenting on Cryo and creating the resonant concept. Or when she fakes an Echo flashback to trick Estinian in uh, 5.0. These are cool ideas to make use of the Echo and she was really the first notable character to do so. And we got characters since then that used the Echo for interesting purposes such as Tenzin or Mikoto. It served to show that the Echo is truly something special and not just a convenient plot device made by the developers to allow us to have those convenient flashbacks every once in a while. As I said in regards to Reen, I give props to writers whenever they give a character some sort of a unique power and then actually utilize it in a logical way throughout the story. So many times you see characters getting stuff just to make them feel unique and cool but they only use those powers like once ever, usually whenever they are introduced. Personality-wise, Kryon is overall a nice and caring person and is very polite. She dislikes it when other people act or ask around her. As with many Archons from Charlie, she is quite smart and knowledgeable, especially in things related to the Echo and Aetherites, though she sometimes tends to miss some obvious things. A noticeable trait of her keen mind is her ability to read people, which she likes to use to her advantage, whether that's divulging people's intentions or tricking them by making use of their particular character traits, and it's another aspect of her character being very themed after her own unique echo abilities, with her having a heightened ability to converse with people and better read the intents of a soul. She was very close to Minfilia and also used to be a mentor to the twins and as such privy to some of their more embarrassing secrets, particularly those of Alfino, something she likes to remind us on a few occasions. In spite of this, she deeply cares about Alfino and plays somewhat of a big sister figure at times. Just as with Reen, we actually do get a surprising amount of insight into her childhood and how she was raised, though it is easily missable as it's only briefly brought up in Eureka. She was raised in an orphanage by the famous Archon Galuf Baldesion, and it was discovered when she was around 12 that she had the mystical power of the Echo. From the get-go, this meant that she was basically a special child and would receive a lot of attention, most of it being attention of the negative kind, unfortunately. Yang Uf wanted to study her power to discover mysteries behind the Echo, and she gave her consent to do so. Ryle eventually joins the organization as a student herself. There, she came to receive contempt by some of the students who were bitter towards people with the Echo, since in their view, it allows such arbitrarily chosen individuals to have far more insight into things and become much more renowned than those without it for less work and effort. This led her to becoming very self-conscious, maybe even slightly insecure. In the end, mainly due to her loving adoptive grandfather, she got over it and in time, Kryon even became fond of the memory of one Ejika, one of the people who were bitter about her unique power. Kryon herself was often worried of what others thought of her since she was very conscious of her special powers and what it entailed, whereas Ejika cared little for the opinions of others. In this way, the two made for an ideal pair 
which Gamuf noted and kinda used this relationship between them to allow Kryl to grow as a person and overcome these negative traits and gain more confidence. Though she did get over it for the most part, it's likely that some elements of her upbringing still linger on. You have to keep in mind that she's still very young, only 22 years old. Another important thing to note about Kryl's character is the traumatic experience she faced after the event with the Isle of Val. That is to say, we know for certain that she does suffer from survivor's guilt. This is made very apparent in Erika Hydatos, where she enters the headquarters of the organization and is now directly facing the source of her trauma, which invokes a strong reaction from her. Now, same as with the video about Reen, I want to quickly TLDR the psychological aspect behind this, so we can then use it to better understand the character. Survivor's guilt in essence refers to a person that went through a traumatic event who now feels guilty for having survived said event while others didn't or they feel guilty for getting away relatively unscathed while others suffered significant loss. What differentiates it from normal grief of losing a loved one is that aspect of having these lingering thoughts which could manifest in different ways. Maybe the person is haunted by the thought of why was it them that survived while these others died, or it could be them questioning themselves as to why they couldn't prevent it from happening, or the person questioning if maybe they themselves contributed to the event or caused it in some manner. So how does this relate to Cryo? I think it's a cool thing to explore. It is pretty rare to see this kind of a character idea, or at least done to a significant extent. You often see civilians and villagers of destroyed places, and they may show signs of being traumatized, but they're often very inconsequential and do not develop throughout the game since they are just background NPCs. In Cryo's case, they have an opportunity to explore it more in depth. One quirk that comes to mind as a result of this is her needing a lot of convincing with both Tancred and Unukahai so she can trust and work with them. In Unukahai's case it kind of makes sense since uh, he's coming off as very ominous, but with Tancred it's a bit irrational when you think about it. On the surface you could say, well she's working with this random rogue, of course she's skeptical. But it's not just a random rogue, is it? It's Archon Tancred, a very well-known student of Muizua and someone who played a pivotal role in helping the realm, both when he was part of the Circle of Knowing and when he joins the Scions following the 7th Umbral Era. Not to mention, he got them out of a tight spot with the Warriors of Darkness shortly beforehand, so it really isn't that rational for her to be doubting his intentions or motivations. It's possible that these kinds of trust issues could be a result of her troubled childhood, but it could also be a result of the traumatic event that she went through. Another trait that probably stems from this are her sassy remarks, uh, funnily enough. People suffering from PTSD often utilize different types of coping mechanisms, and given how often she fires off these sassy remarks, it's very probable that this is the coping mechanism that she chooses to use. Now that we've established the basis for her character, we can have a look at her character arc and subsequently what direction we might expect for her character to be taken in a walker. Let's rewind to 3.1 then. She's introduced as a character with the Echo and sheds some light to the group and us, the player, as to what the Echo is as well as a crystal of light. The reason she's there is to offer help in finding the Scion's still missing members, Tancred and Minfilia. She manages to do so thanks to her unique ability as given to her by the Echo, which is described as the ability to hear the whispers of a soul. We'll get into that later. Anyway, so she uses the ancient crystal of light provided by Matoya and tracks down Tancred. She then joins the Scions of the Seventh Dawn. A quick note here, because I saw this confusing some people who were claiming that Cryo isn't actually a Scion. I think the confusion comes from the fact that there was never a scene acknowledging it, 
she kinda just joins off screen after the events of 3.1. Anyway, after joining the Scions, she makes great use of her unique Echo ability and uses it to track down Minfilia, recognize that Estinian is still alive inside Nidhogg's shade, attempting to locate and subsequently taking care of the Scions after they were summoned to the first, and so on. She also helps the warrior of light, Unukalhai and the others to resolve the warring triad crisis. This questline, as well as the events during Heavensward, are important for Kryl, as she gains a ton of hands-on experience on living in Eorzea, place most tumultuous and filled with danger. Initially, she shows quite a lot of fear when facing these challenges, namely when she first encounters Sephiroth, or when she first witnesses Nidhogg's rage, as well as later on when she meets Xenos and Inirika. If you pay very close attention to her voice, you can actually hear it progressively gain more confidence and determination. Seeing this kind of growth in her throughout the course of the expansions is pretty awesome to see. Like I said, keep in mind, she's still young and though she's a very accomplished student and a powerful healer, she nonetheless lacks experience and had a troubled past between her having less than ideal upbringing and the trauma that came with her entire hometown being obliterated. When the time comes to reclaim Alamigo, she ends up joining the resistance, playing an important healer combat role to the resistance. She's a long way from home now, fighting a war very distant from her homeland, and though she could return at any point to the safety of Charlien, she's already too invested into being a scion and helping Eorzea, and so, she helps the Alamigans with this war over their liberty. There's actually a scene I would like to point out here, because it's pretty great. It's where Kryl ends up grilling the Warrior of Light for the standing there instead of helping to patch up Yushtola, especially if you happen to play a healer. Don't just stand there gawping! You're a healer, aren't you? And she stays calm and composed throughout the situation, even though everything's going to shit all around them. This is a nice example of show, don't tell, as we get to actually see that Kryl is a pretty competent healer, and it also reflects her growth from earlier, when she would easily be afraid under these kinds of situations. Some people got a bit irked by it, because you are the legend, the warrior of light, and she's firing orders at you. At a first glance, this seems a bit odd, especially since Kryl 2 has been really respectful towards the Warrior of Light throughout their journeys together. But this is honestly pretty realistic. It actually reminded me of my own time in the military, because I used to know quite a few combat medics, and exactly how Kryl is portrayed in this game is how they are trained. They abide by the Hippocratic Oath, and their job is to save people's lives so it does indeed happen that in a medical situation, an NCO medic outranks everyone, for example by telling an officer to fuck off if they are in some way risking one of their patients' lives, hence they could easily dress down even a 5-star general, or in Kryl's case, reprimand the esteemed warrior of light for just standing there with a thumb up their arse when people are in danger of dying. Again, it serves to show that she's quite competent at being a healer in the field, because she isn't letting her feelings towards the warrior of light or their status affect her doing her job. She then gets to feel the full consequences of this decision to join the resistance, as she ends up being captured by Fordola's forces. What follows is a very twisted and cruel turn of events, and I reckon most people didn't think of the full picture of what happened. When she was with the students of Baldesion, she willingly let herself to be used as a test subject, so that people with good intentions could use her gift for good ends. Yet, in this instance, it's completely reversed and wrong. She's taken against her will, exploited by people with malicious intent, and her power ends up being used only to fuel a madman being able to murder people more effectively. You can already see the immense amount of fear in her before any of the experiments even start. After she is rescued, you can visibly see her traumatized by the event. Her voice becomes very weak and she's struggling to put those words out. 
And luckily, she gets a chance to escape from it when it's revealed that the Isle of Val has been located in the glass ocean. And she asks the aid of Hancock, Rowena and the Warrior of Light to help her discover the mystery behind all of this. This is a convenient spot for me to run through the entire story of Eureka, so I will do it here. During the Third Astral Era, there existed a particularly powerful icon named Eureka that had the unique ability to materialize any wish its master would ask of them, provided there was enough ether to supply. Though most, if not all, of its creations ended up being weapons, because, you know, people want to kill each other and such, a creation of Eureka, such as a weapon, would gain somewhat of a sentience of its own, which is influenced by the desire behind the person who willed it into existence. Should one wield such a weapon for an extended period of time, they would be susceptible to becoming enthralled by the weapon itself. While similar to iconic corruptions last tempering on paper, it actually works quite differently. The weapon forged by Eureka would eventually end up usurping the user's ether until no trace of the original host remains. The weapon then develops a mind of its own, its purpose becoming that of the wish which impelled its creation. In other words, Erika would seek out a master to cast down the wicked, enticing them with the prospect of a powerful weapon, and the weapon itself would be a ticking time bomb before it takes hold of the user. Erika itself was imprisoned by a warrior of light, being trapped in much the same way as Kori was through the usage of a crystal of light, which could help explain its weird Rubik's Cube form. The elegance eventually got a hold of Eureka, who then deemed the icon and its weapons too dangerous and locked it away beneath the crystal tower alongside all the weapons it had forged. During the sixth astral era, Ganluf Baldesion and three other people who would be the founders of the students of Baldesion, came to learn of Eureka's existence. Their headquarters were located in the Isle of Val, a very hostile environment and, despite its vicinity to the motherland, most Charlians refused to settle there. The students of Baldesion got around this danger mainly by making heavy use of etherites that comprised an elaborate ethernet connected to ethernet relays. The organization existed primarily to observe and gain insight into the power of the Echo, particularly that which manifested in Cryo, although there was another more sinister reason for its existence. The island was built to house the primal Eureka that Galuf and three of his companions sealed away when they realized that they would be unable to defeat it. They also recovered weapons created by said primal and stored it into a vault within the island. The island was to be the primal's prison. The research into the Echo and documenting Eureka were both done for the same purpose, to find a way to destroy the primal. Galuf and company then used the Etherite network to divert the ethereal currents to turn the Isle of Val into an arcane world. The goal was not only to seal the primal, though. He then inverted the pattern, thus reversing the ethereal flow. In layman's terms, the world was modified in a specific way to restrict the primal of an energy source so that Eureka would slowly wither away and die. This plan came into jeopardy when the Ashians figured out where Eureka was being hidden. Gangu figured that due to Eureka's ability to synthesize anything into existence, the Ashians could pull all sorts of dangerous schemes utilizing it to bring about a calamity, as it would drain the entire land of Ether in its attempt to create something massive. So, he took drastic measures. He would cast a powerful teleportation magic akin to flow, sending the island, the Ashian, and Eureka all into the livestream deleting all of these problems in one fell swoop. And so, the entire island vanished in a blink of an eye. None on the island had time to evacuate, and they dissipated into ether within the livestream. Kryl was the only survivor of the teleportation who survived thanks to her blessing of light. 
When hearing of these events, the Scions wrongly assumed that the Isle of Val was targeted by Ashians or the like, unleashing a destructive magic akin to Ultima. What Galuf didn't bank on, however, was that the Primal was so powerful that sooner or later it was able to expend most of its energy to pull back the island from the livestream, hence it resurfacing on the other side of the world. The entire island traveling through the livestream in such a fashion came with some significant repercussions. Warped elemental energies, erratic weather, twisted ethereal currents, magicite, logograms, powerful monsters, and more. Ryo and his friend Ejika, who had survived the event due to being away at the time, then enter Erika with the warrior flight. Paimo uses an avatar of itself to walk around trying to manipulate the warrior flight and Ejika, the latter whom pretends to fall under his influence. Ejika, in the process of faking to be manipulated by Erika, damages the Aetherite network, thus breaking the ward. Without the ward to bind or drain it of Aether, Erika can feed on the ethereal currents to regain its strength and eventually break free of the barrier surrounding the headquarters where it was sealed. Cryo proposes an alternative, infusing magicide with copious amounts of Aether to create a new focal point. Next, Cryo and the Wall Area of Light plan to finally enter the headquarters where the primal is sealed. Getting inside the headquarters is difficult due to it containing a ward of its own. Under normal circumstances, a student of Baldesion could easily gain access by teleporting inside, but a high concentration of ether around the ward makes teleportation way too risky. She so instead proposes to visit via a back door, so to speak, to allow individuals without the capability to teleport access to the headquarters. They constructed an ether bridge that would bring them to the entrance. Ryle intends to restore the bridge and use it as a way to enter the headquarters. Inside the headquarters, a lot of memories come flooding in and Kryle has that strong reaction I mentioned earlier. She is unable to confront it however as there are more pressing matters to worry about. To restore the ward, Kryle has to disable the restraints that keep the primal sealed. She does so, and Ichika allows the warrior flight to destroy Erika's avatar. The only thing left then was to get rid of Erika itself. The primal was weakened a ton after returning from the livestream, which presented them the opportunity that did not exist for the four founders, destroying the elder primal for good. There's two options that the player can choose from with the same outcome. Both options involve Ejika sacrificing himself to defeat Erika, but shortly before Erika drained him of all his ether, he would retreat into the livestream similar to Ustola casting flow and then re-emerge once Primal was dead, and in both options, when Erika is defeated, its ether wouldn't be given back to the ethereal realm like would normally happen with Primal's dying. This was due to the presence of its weapons. Having become Primal's in essence, the weapons would have been quick to absorb such untethered ether. If you maintain the ward, this means that the primal cannot be defeated for good. If you sacrificed Ejika, this meant that he was being cucked from being able to re-emerge from the livestream, which means that you have to essentially clear a Baldesian arsenal to get the full ending. The difference between the two options is that when you support Kryle's option of maintaining the ward and figuring out a solution, the two eventually discover this plan and it gets executed perfectly after you go clear the Baldesian arsenal. When you sacrifice Ejika, it ends up being a trigger for Kryle's PTSD, because the event of her being the sole survivor is once again replayed with Ejika dying and her being the only one left. Luckily, the warrior flight is able to pull her out of it, and in this path, Kryle uses her echo skill to discover Ejika's plan by following the trail of his etheric essence. She went all the way to Gridania to learn the technique they had used in plucking Ustola out of the live stream, and she is confident she can pull off the same with her keen ability to read souls, after which she does indeed recover Ejika from the live stream. In both cases, 
you get a happy ending and Cryo generally grows a lot from the ordeal, which can be seen, or rather heard, once again through her voice in the Shadowbringers cutscenes featuring her. So, the entire Eureka story is then wrapped up in a neat little bow, right? An important thing to note is that when Cryo enters the Baldesian headquarters and almost has that breakdown, she doesn't actually confront the situation, she simply brushes it aside because of more acute things going on. The thing about trauma is of course that it's hard to overcome it unless you face it, talk about it, treat it psychologically. In spite of that, I think her being able to talk about it to the Warrior of Light, even if there are a little bit of a passive listener, did help her somewhat. If we go back to talking about psychology a bit here, Another thing to keep in mind about trauma is that it can take a very long time for a person to accept whatever has happened and live with it. And the psychological trauma from survivors killed in specific is especially nasty because of the factors I mentioned earlier, and this can linger in a person for a very long time. Let me give you an anecdote. Amy Over was a student that survived the Columbine school shooting in 1999. 20 years later, as she was dropping off her daughter at preschool and as she was walking back to her car, she collapsed, but not due to a heart attack, but due to the trauma of her watching her daughter walking to that school, because all those bad memories came flooding in within that moment, resulting in a panic attack and a collapse. Just think about that for a second. 20 years later, and she's still heavily scarred from the event. Now, of course, when we talk about a video game character, we can't quite use realistic proportions even if we wanted to, because, you know, it's a video game and we need to get things moving, though that doesn't of course mean you cannot convey this kind of growth in a character. In fact, Tancred's story arc is a good example of this being done, where, after a very arduous journey, he finally overcame his trauma regarding Minfilia. It was a pretty extensive story arc that took up a sizable portion of the Shadowbringer story. I would like to see something similar happen with Cryo, though obviously with less emphasis as Tankard is one of the leading characters, whereas she is not. This is because we can pretty safely infer that Cryo has not fully moved on from the destruction of the place she spent most of her childhood in, and being the sole survivor of said event, Given how recent the event was and how she brushed it aside in Eureka, as well as whatever trauma she had after those experiments on her, which seemed to be pretty devastating to her mentally. Yes, she's grown quite a lot as a character, as I have been pointing out throughout this video, but most of it was very subtle, you could even say it was off screen almost, and it easily goes over a lot of people's heads. However, I think this makes for an excellent opportunity to finally give her some proper screen time. Alright, so let me give you an idea. We know that teleporting incorrectly can be damaging the body even lethal if the person ends up being adrift in the livestream and never emerging at their destination. As Urian J points out in the final coil questline, any form of experimental ethereal travel is volatile and doesn't have any guarantee of succeeding. And, well, teleporting an entire island with an incredibly powerful Elder Primal and an Asian is something I would count as an unorthodox teleportation method. What we assume is that everyone dissipated into Aether within the livestream, but it's also possible some may have retained enough of their body and soul until Eureka had the island re-emerge, and then they either died from that particular impact or were killed afterwards by the Void Scent and other monstrosities that took over the island. There's also the case of 4 to 5 members of the students of Baldesion who used the weapons and were turned into basically primals, either by being somehow coerced by Eureka or trying to use them to somehow aid in destroying Eureka. Anyway, my point here is that there's a lot here where we don't have too many details the whole Eureka story is a little vague in general. What this leads me to believe is that there's a possibility that the four founders, Dorgan, Zesad, Kelger, and Ganguf, are still alive, or at the very least, just Ganguf. Let me give you a couple of reasons. One, 
it's a tried and true JRPG rule where if a character dies off screen, never assume that they actually died and on that note we are playing FF14. <laughs> People don't die in this game, don't be silly. 2. The writers deliberately left their fates uncertain, not to mention there's been plenty of cases where characters get blocked from the livestream in the past so it's not like it's an unknown concept. 3. As I pointed out earlier, this is a very special type of occasion so anything could happen. 4. The F14 devs love bringing back aspects from older quest lines and incorporating them into newer ones. The reason I propose this is because these characters play kind of an important role in the story when we take into consideration that Erika is a world ending threat, but it all gets concluded with very little oomph. I mean, these guys get all together like 4 cutscenes total. It also felt like they were trying to set up some kind of a character with Galuf, probably similar to how he is in F5. This kind of slightly goofy and impulsive but really straightforward, no nonsense type of an old guy with a heart of gold and very loyal to his comrades. I think having Galoof return would make him and Kryon a very powerful character duo, as we get the impression that similar to their FF5 counterparts, the two deeply care for and look out for each other. But also, if she got a chance to meet her adoptive grandfather, it could finally be that thing that makes her fully get over that survivor's guilt trauma and finally accept everything that happened to grow stronger out of it. This would also be awesome because even if both Kryon and Galoof are somewhat similar as characters to their FF5 counterparts, if they went with this route, it could allow them to go on a completely separate direction with them, because in FF5, spoiler happens and we don't get to see the two together that much. Hence, FF14 could develop a happier what if scenario and you kind of keep riding off of that. Similar to how the return to Ivalis Raid series was a happy ending as opposed to the ending of Final Fantasy Tactics. Not to mention, after Luizua has been gone for so long, we could definitely use another old man mentor type of figure. Except the thing with Galuf is that he's also pretty hilarious, so I think he would make a fantastic addition to the FF14 cast, even if he'd be a more minor character like Cryo. The game has potentially already set up something like this, when you stop to think about it. After rescuing Cryo, we learn that the experiments have made her senses become even more heightened, thus she can see traces of ether left behind by people even better. Then we have Erika, where in one of the outcomes, she visits Gridania and straight up learns from the Seed Seers how to pull someone out of the livestream as was done with Ushtola, and she uses this to great effect as she is able to pull Ejika out from the livestream. That is to say, this all points to the idea that Kryle's ability to sense someone's etheric signature and her plucking someone out of the livestream skills are at an all-time high. And what better way to drive this home than have her bring back her beloved grandfather. Of course, the issue with Galoof is that there's two possibilities. He either got obliterated when Erika made the island re-emerge, or he has been adrift in the ethereal sea all this time, which will make it very difficult to have survived all this time chilling there. Orian J describes the situation thus, If it be so, I do fear for our friend. Contrary to its name, the livestream is more akin to a raging torrent. Linger over long in the midst of its maelstrom and the ether that formeth one's soul shall surely be scattered, never to be reformed. This indicates that prolonged periods of time spent in there makes it exponentially more difficult to get out. Consider that Galoof and the others teleported the island all the way back in 2.2, hence a considerable amount of time has passed. So regardless of what happened to him after the teleportation, the odds of him surviving seem rather bleak at best. But again, consider that this is a very exceptional set of circumstances. Galoof in this game seems like a pretty sharp guy, so I could imagine he might have set up some kind of a contingency plan to help him, or even everyone on the island come out alive from this situation. 
what this plan could be, I don't know, I'm not a writer, but he could have potentially tricked Eureka into making some kind of a weapon that would have helped them survive the trip as an example. Then, in Endwalker, perhaps Cryo discovers that Ganguf could be recovered, maybe discovering some kind of tech, where, uh, whether that be from the concepts left by the ancients on the moon, um, or within archives in Charlian to allow her to pull someone out of the live stream, even if next to nothing of their soul remains, if she happens to have a very strong connection to them. To limit this so that she can't just do this to any random character, you could just make it be a one-time thing. Maybe she does it once and it was so taxing that her senses weaken permanently, something along those lines. I've talked about cryo suffering from survivor's guilt throughout this video and how it's a part of her character, Here's a badass little way you could reflect her growth. Remember that coat she wears? Well, turns out it even has a name. It's called the Coat of Nine Lives. Ganguf himself gave it to Kryon as a present. The large ears on the cape are intended to act as a symbol of the Echo, and the garment itself represents Ganguf's belief that powers such as Kryon's are individual traits and nothing to be feared. Cryo, of course, grew very fond of the outfit, and so she kept using it up to this date. The problem with that, however, is that while it is something to honor the memory of Ganguf, it also serves to potentially remind her of that traumatic event. Perhaps a change of glamours is in order for Cryo? Alpha 14 certainly likes to do it a lot, represent character growth through outfit changes, and I certainly could see something similar happening with Cryo. Especially when you consider this artwork where you see her without the hood. I talked about this with Reen, that the Japanese rely heavily on hair to kinda symbolically convey changes within a character. In FF9, Garnet cuts her hair after a spoiler. In FF14, Ryan's hair color changes to indicate her finally finding her own resolve. That kind of stuff. Her revealing her hair could be symbolic for her finally accepting her being a survivor of the incident and the removal of the cowl would be a sign that she is no longer running from her past, therefore she has nothing to hide. In Shadowbringers, we learned that the power of the Echo is in fact not an extremely vague mystical power without any rhyme or reason, but rather that it is quite simply something that can manifest in a fragmented individual who is a reincarnation of an Amorotian who did not get sacrificed to Zodiac. Everyone who is a shard of an ancient upon seeing a star shower gains this power that we call the Echo. Many things are shed light on in regards to the Echo, but focusing on the one relevant to the video is the fact that it explains why, to quote Cryon, no two manifestations of the Echo are alike, because you gain a very weak version of whatever ability the Ancient wielded that you are a reincarnation of. How does this relate? Well, let me represent to you my crackpot theory of the day. Cryon equals Heitlodeus, uh, crying Odeus. <laughs> Does that sound awesome or what? Anyway, what the hell am I talking about? First of all, let me debunk the Ustola equals Heitlodeus theory that some people have pointed out in the past. This makes sense on the surface. They have a similar emote and in 5.3 Ustola appears right after Hitlo disappears and it's not very conclusive but it's something. However, her actually being a reincarnation of Hythlo is very unlikely, if not straight up impossible. This is made evident when she sees a star shower and does not awaken to the Echo. This confirms that she is not a reincarnation of an ancient that didn't get sacked, hence it's impossible for her to be a fragmented version of Hythlo. You could say that she doesn't awaken because she's in this weird state of being and not being in the first, due to Grahatia's space magic, but this is a bit implausible, not to mention she ought to have awakened the Echo at some point, especially given that she was there during the transition from the 6th Astral Era to the 7th Umbral Era. 
Now then, how does youth law relate to crime? The first thing we can draw conclusions with is by looking at the unique abilities of each of these individuals. Inside story number 4 from the Tales from the Shadow series of short stories, we are given more insight into the power that Emmet Selk has and it's also revealed that Huthlodeus had basically the exact same skill as him. In this short story, and the way it's described in cutscenes, is the ability to gaze into someone's soul, even seeing the hue to tell any kind of soul apart. Now, this is very vague. I mean, <laughs> what the hell, do souls have colors now? But the wording of this becomes important for a point later. In any case, to break it down a bit more here, I don't often copy-paste information from the Final Fantasy wiki, because, you know, I kinda wanna put my own thoughts out there, but it puts rather well in describing Hithlo's powers, where it's worded thus. He could perceive the underworld as well as the intent, form and ether of others. Quick mention on the terminology here. Underworld is synonymous with the ethereal realm, and a layman's term in Eorzea for the ethereal realm is the live stream. So in essence, all three words mean the same thing, it just depends who you are talking to. Kinda like the difference between primal and icon, it's, it's just the same thing. Cryo's ability, on the other hand, is described as being sensitive to the whispers of the soul, their intent, their very essence even and the ability to follow a person's ethereal trail. The wording of Cryon's ability, as well as the fact that she needed to use a powerful crystal of light to properly follow Tankard's trail, suggests that she is quite weak with this skill, which of course makes sense, she is a fragmented individual after all. In essence, the description between these skills is very similar, almost identical, the main difference being that Cryon's version is much weaker. Furthermore, both Emmet Selk and Kryl are the only characters that interact with the livestream in a major way in this game. In fact, there has only been two recorded cases of a character bringing back someone from the livestream without any outside help. Once again, Emmet's and Hitzlo's abilities are near identical, so anything Emmet Selk was able to do, Hitlodeus could as well, and in accordance to this theory, so could Kryl just with a lot less potential. There's another parallel besides the one with the livestream, and that's the personalities of both Hithrodeus and Kryl. In the short story, Hithrodeus is constantly teasing and trolling Emetzel, just being sassy all around, yet still cares for him deeply. This is so similar, almost identical to how Kryl enjoys teasing the likes of Alfino, but is still loyal and always there for them. Another thing I wish to point out here is that there aren't all that many characters with the Echo whose special powers are explicitly stated, nor are there that many ancients whose special powers are explicitly stated. Thus, through method of exclusion, we can find the most likely candidate for the powers of each ancient. Let me demonstrate this through this little presentation. First up, we have all the unsundered Ashians. Now, all these guys have their special powers, but they don't matter because they weren't sundered, thus no one would reincarnate as them. Then, we have people from Amarod. The only two with special powers that we know of are Hythlodeus, who has a power similar to Emmet Selk as described earlier, and Azem, who had the ability to readily summon allies to their aid to great effect. Then let's look at characters with the Echo. First, we can write off all these people because their specific echo abilities are never explored. Tenzin has the ability to speak to animals, which, by the way, I would like to correct what I said in my Forlords video, that the echo would innately let him speak to animals by the virtue of understanding all language. Cryo straight up says she can't speak to animals, hence it was a power specific to Tenzin. Then we have Mikoto, who can see these visions of the future. Neither of these skills are represented by any ancient that we know as of now, so we can ignore those. Then we have the Warrior of Light and Artbird, who are reincarnations of Azem, thus they share his ability to call allies upon their aid, albeit in a much weaker fashion. What does that leave us? Cryo, whose echo ability is being sensitive to the whispers of the soul, and Hythodeus, 
whose special ability was being able to gaze into someone's soul and figure stuff related to that in great detail. Mind you, this isn't 100% conclusive as we simply haven't explored that many Ancients or Echo users, however, given the information we have now, it's the best educated guess we can make. Final point, I mentioned earlier the specific wording that is used to describe Hutlow's ability, the hue of a soul. Well, it becomes relevant when we look at Zeno's first encounter with Van Daniel. He fires up his resonant ability and goes, that hue, your soul is, who are you? This right here is a pretty clear cut parallel as no one else, aside from Hythodeus, talks about souls as a hue or a color. Now, where do you think Xenos got that from? That's right, when Kryon was being experimented upon. Remember what I said about Kryon's sensitivity becoming heightened after the experiment? And then there's the thing she said when Estinian tells of his encounter with Xenos. This of course shows us that the experimentation amplified the Ancient's ability, in this case Hutmordeus's, if we go with my theory, within both Kryon and Xenos, and what we see there in his first time meeting with Van Daniel, is that his skill with it is so strong that it's directly comparable to Tad Hythodeus. Now, of course, there is another theory related to this, which I will discuss in my video about Xenos, but for the purpose of this, I think it serves to give us another hint that maybe Cryo is Hythodeus. Well, these have been my thoughts on my Cryo equals Hythodeus theory. Keep in mind this is all speculation, and I reckon this might be something that will never be full on confirmed even if it is what the writers intended since it's always a good idea to leave in mysteries to your story that keeps nerds like me up at night. Regardless, I'ma be happy if something substantial does come from this. This is also where I'm gonna wrap up this video. I hope you enjoyed this video on Kryon, otherwise known as one of the potatoes that most people actually like. And I'd be interested to know, what do y'all think of Kryon as a character? Are you excited to see more of her? Do you think they will bench her within the first 5 minutes of 6.0? Did you find my theory sound or less valid than Queen69's assessment of F14? As always, if you enjoyed, subbing is an easy way to stick around for more character analysis videos and the like. In any case, have a nice day.